In terms of traditional architecture, of course, they're going to be reviving other European ideas. For example, the Paris Opera House, which is neo-Baroque or Baroque Revival. More famously, we see Westminster Palace, and this is going to be your classic Gothic Revival. All those spires, the verticality, the tall pointed windows, it all yells Gothic. And so we're going to see that not only in monumental architecture, but some of these ideas will come out in homes. So we start with the Gothic Revival at Westminster, and it plays off of those cathedral ideas, uh, but we're doing it on a very horizontal scale, whereas our cathedrals would be very, very vertical in overall form. Uh, this is a, overall a very horizontal structure. That is your basic line across it. But they're doing everything they can, the use of pilasters, the use of vertical elements and spires to draw your eye up. And of course here, they're not trying to draw your eye up in a form of spirituality, but rather this idea of the growth and development of the English Empire in the 19th century. We also see the same thing in New York at St. Patrick's Cathedral, which is a more direct representation of modern Gothic or Gothic revival. We have our rose window, we have our massive spires, everything is highly vertical. It doesn't have quite the sculptural elements that you would expect from European Gothic, but of course that's not really a requirement. And when we get inside, we see the use of rib vaults, although they're using very decorative rib vaulting across the ceiling rather than something more basic like what we would see in the Gothic. But of course they can do that with the new methods. There's steel and other materials being used here you would never use in the old cathedrals. So a lot of updates, a lot of changes taking place. And in terms of homes, <clears throat> I want to look at all of these, because all of these refer to what we would call a Victorian home. It's a catch-all 19th century home, usually a large home in many cases. But we're going to see a number of these, and the homes will mimic the furniture period. So the dates are really the high point for that form. In this case, Gothic Revival, where we see those very steep roofs. Uh, we will often see some pointed arch elements drawn into it. Uh, a less expensive form that we see more across the Midwest is going to be called Carpenter Gothic. This is a simpler wooden form. Now, in the Gothic, they're trying to get people outside, so we tend to see large porches, as we saw here in these two examples, but also here. And I'm bringing up this house for Carpenter Gothic because that is the house in Iowa that was used as the backdrop for Grant Wood's American Gothic, a painting of his dentist and his dentist's daughter reflecting a farmer and a farmer's daughter called American Gothic. And let me re remind you that Gothic means uncouth or barbaric. It's an art historical term that's been attached to the entire Gothic movement, and then we reuse it for revivals. And it's being used in the painting because people see the farmers as backwards, uncouth, and barbaric. If you're a New York financier in 1930, that's probably your opinion. Now, there's a lot more to the painting, but I want to call it to your attention. And what makes this Gothic... Uh, Carpenter Gothic Gothic is the steep roof, our Gothic classic Gothic window, of course, split into those pointed arches, the large porch. These are all elements that we're going to associate with Gothic architecture in homes. We're also going to see the use of uh, verge boards, and these are decorative moldings, usually under the eaves, that just sort of break the form. Uh, it allows you to add some lacy, delicate decoration to what is otherwise a very monolithic structure, breaking it up, making it look more interesting. Now, you could use this in interior design because, of course, we have times where you have something that is just dominating a room, and maybe the use of a fringe, the use of some kind of little decorative detail can break that and make it more interesting. We will also see various drops, uh, drop ornamentation. So there can be elements, for example, here that, uh, and at the bases, 
that will be decorative. Things like pineapples and other fruit, uh, acorns, oak motifs, etc. So, looking at the Gothic Revival, and for all of these I have illustrations uh, working this out. We tend to see a finial of some form, not always, uh, in the Carpenter Gothic. This will be a weather vane of some form. We're going to see the use of that decorative border. We're going to see a very steep roof. We're going to see walls extended all the way up into the gables. So this is just a flat wall going up as opposed to what we've seen in the past, frequently a curved uh, or slanted wall that acts as part of the roof. We often see these cut-in windows, either three-part or four-part, uh, trefoil or quatrefoil. We see pointed arches, drip moldings, which uh, go around a window and are supposed to stop water pouring down the wall into the window. We see a lot of leaded glass with diamond patterns, full-width porches, and sometimes we will see even Gothic arches used in the porches as details. So a lot going on here. Now this brings us to the Octagon House. The Octagon House was developed as a form of efficient housing. It was supposed to be energy efficient, allowing heat to stay in one place. You can heat from the center and it kind of goes equidistant to the sides. And of course, a circle home is not terribly, uh, well, pragmatic in most cases. So an octagon is as close as you get. They're taking this idea from Eastern religion, uh, pri Eastern, uh, what we would think of e as Eastern Christianity, Byzantine, uh, structures where we see a lot of octagonal central plan structures. Now this one of course is in Watertown, but the idea is efficiency. The problem is no one wants to live in one because a lot of the corners aren't squared. So where do you put a desk if there isn't a nice square corner to fit it into or a dresser or any other piece of furniture? Everything once you get into the rooms is going to be angled. And these always stand out because, well, they are quite literally in the form of an octagon. Then we see Second Empire or General Grant. If you're in Europe, it's Second Empire. If you're in the US, it's General Grant. Same basic principles. What you're going to see is this very steep uh, mansard roof. Uh, you're going to see a lot of dormier windows uh, as well as colored glass windows and a lot of them, generally symmetrical to the structure. Uh, we will see a lot of decorative ironwork, sometimes decorative woodwork. Uh, being used as well as massive cornice and supporting brackets. Now, this becomes very common in the period 1855 to 1885 when the United States has gotten over the Civil War, of course, ending in 1865, and this uh, form takes off after that. And it will be named after the Civil War hero General Grant, not because he designs it or has anything to do with it, but he happens to be particularly popular at the time. Now we're going to look at the stick style, and again, another Victorian style. This is more common, but very, very detailed. So this is a wood construction, a primarily wood construction. We will generally see a decorative gabled truss. Uh, so a decorative truss, very similar to those details that we saw on the Gothic Revival, but here it's arched. It's up at the very top of our gable. We see a very steep roof, sometimes with dormiers cut in, uh, as we see here. We will see multi-textured wall surfaces. So we have everything from clabbered to vertical siding to what appears to be flat siding. We will see raised horizontal and vertical boards breaking up the space. They're borrowing this from the Romans, and they're just trying to break what would otherwise be large plain walls. We will often see deck, uh, diagonal braces in the porch. Porches tend to be fairly large with most of these. Once again, the idea being that it brings in air and it gives you an outside space. Uh, we will have overhanging eaves and sometimes with exposed rafters. The overhanging eaves are there to try and get rid of some of the excess snow and such and have it drop off the roof rather than onto lower elements. Of course, wooden siding, uh, siding and trim can contrast, so we see a lot of different color schemes. Uh, these are generally very bright, very busy looking homes. 
Why would you ever want to know about this? Well, at the end of the day, if you pull up to a client's home and you can identify the type of house, I guarantee you, you've already gotten an in with the client and it can often inform how you're going to want to decorate the interior. Then we see Romanesque Revival, and this is a broad term. Of course, all of these are broad terms. They're subgroups within them. For example, there's the Romanesque Richardson, which is a very specific form of home. But here we're looking at Romanesque Revival overall. Oftentimes, they're going to be stone, mimicking that medieval idea of building with stone. But of course, you know that that's probably a stone veneer or a brick veneer rather than the uh, primary load-bearing function that we would see in the Romanesque. We will see stone chimneys. We will see wood shingle siding uh, on towers, uh, as well as the rest of the structure. We will often see these conical tower uh, roofs, which are very interesting, and I feel for the roofer. Uh, very steep gabled roofs, once again. We often will see, and we see one back here, a hip roof dormier so in other words the front of the dormier is cut off instead of coming all the way to the level of the window it's cut off to give us a little more of a slant we see the use of rounded not pointed arches the use of stone bands along the facade uh, stone columns of course used if there's a porch and sometimes coarsed rubble stone walls although in this case this one is brick but here in my drawing we see the use of coarsed rubble now, the Queen Anne Revival is argued at times to be the wooden version of the Romanesque Revival. So, it's kind of a mix between our stick house and our Romanesque Revival. Again, very, very common. You can see this massive, proud Victorian. And again, not all the rules apply on every home. But we're going to see the use of decorative windows, such as you can see there's one hidden in this arch at the top of the tower. And there are tower Queen Anne's and other forms. You could see this without the tower. It would still be a Queen Anne. We see the use of wood shingles uh, as siding. You're going to see that more on the East Coast than anywhere else. We're going to see second floor balconies, which we see up here, for example. Rectangular sash windows are going to be used for the first time. So people are opening windows on a regular basis rather than just a swing. Uh, so sort of a door-like window that swings open. We're going to see double-hung windows. Uh, you're going to see the use of masonry piers, which we can't see here, but you know it's there hidden under the bushes. We see the use of decorative forms and... Uh, spindled friezes are going to be really common here. We see that spindled frieze, if you look carefully, right in there uh, under the walkway. And a lot of these large Victorians, at least in the Midwest, in Wisconsin, are going to be your homes downtown or your homes that are used as funeral homes uh, because they're massive, massive structures. Today, they're not as popular because, of course, they're very inefficient and difficult to heat which is why you should all build a yurt or an octagonal house. Then we see East Lake. East Lake is a form of Queen Anne, uh, sort of taking off of the Romanesque and the Queen Anne. And East Lake is really important. East Lake is a manufacturer of furniture. He's a designer, and he comes up with this form of home, very common in parts of the Midwest, primarily Ohio, uh, but you see them all over the place. And what you're going to see is siding that can often be uh, barge board or shingle, uh, various different forms. We see a lot of stick work, which are these vertical and horizontal details that have been added to the surface. Sometimes you'll see stucco elements. We'll see a recessed bay or some kind of bay here coming out. And of course, from an interior perspective, that's fantastic. That's extra space. That'd be a great reading nook, for example. We will generally see a square tower, not a round tower, uh, with a pyramidal turret once again. We will see some form of frieze running around the house. Here we see that frieze above the porches, but then running along as stick work along the facade of the house. Oftentimes, although not here, we will see a sunburst pattern in the bracing, uh, either here in the cornice or here above the porch. And we will often see geometric stained glass windows as we see 
in the doors. So very interesting style. Eastlake combs tend to be a little bit smaller than some of the other Victorians. So look out for that. It could be a one and a half story like we see here, but it's still an Eastlake Victorian. Then we see shingle style. Don't worry, we'll get to the end of this yet. Uh, the shingle style tends to be covered in shingle. And this was just another uh, design idea. You see these sometimes in Chicago, but they're primarily East Coast. That use of shingle as siding tends to be East Coast. We tend to see decorative attic windows, as we see right here. Uh, we see that exterior shingle. We will see second floor balconies of some form. Here's the exterior balcony on the photographed example. The porch columns, although here they're very thin, they're probably iron, uh, in many cases will be shingled as well. We're going to see turned porch railings, which we don't see here since they have a porch wall running around. Again, that idea of variation. And the doors will generally have some kind of oval opening although not always. So these things can form and hybridize and play around. You might see a Romanesque with Queen Anne features or a Gothic with shingle features. These are all happening at more or less the same time. They're all feeding off of one another. And of course, the person designing it isn't entirely the architect. It's going to be a customer which means you get all sorts of mixed styles. This is also why I hate McMansions, which mix these styles all the time. They have neoclassical columns, and then they have a Renaissance uh, sort of symmetry to them, and then they'll bring in these Victorian elements, like a turret, which you would never see. You get the idea. It's just painful. Then we see the colonial revival, of course, going back to Georgian colonial, sort of the end of our English colonial period. And here we see uh, these dormiers, uh, very, very common. We see Doric pilasters oftentimes, not always. We will see some kind of pediment over the windows. Here there's a flat cornice, but oftentimes we'll either have some kind of triangular or arch-shaped pediment over the windows. These are almost always symmetrical, at least when they start. Of course, you can tell the porch is likely an add-on. And we're going to see some kind of porch, and it's going to use Tuscan columns, very, very simple columns. On occasion, you see something else. Also, frequently, the chimneys are going to be on either side, this coming from the Dutch colonial idea, of course, more so than the English colonial, and that's that hybridization that we've been talking about. 